Welcome to the Human Origin Project, where we explore the science of you. To keep up to date, go to our iTunes channel and subscribe, and please leave a review if you enjoyed today's show. On today's show, we're going to talk about the mysterious origins of Halloween. Everyone's familiar with the death and dread theme of Halloween, but did you know that there is a global culture of celebrating such a holiday all over the world, both in the Northern and Southern Hemisphere? Why would this be so? Today, we track back on research that showed that Halloween had some very similar themes that could be astronomically linked. We look at the implications that the Halloween holiday could be implying and also the astronomy of meteors, which seems to be observed in the late October and early November period. Also, the event in Siberia, Russia, where a near-Earth object could have been associated with a time that links to the Halloween holiday. I hope you enjoy today's show, and if you do, please leave a review on iTunes. It helps us to propagate this information. If you'd like to discuss or read more, you can visit our website, humanoriginproject.com, and read the article, The Spooky Origins of Halloween. Hope you enjoy today's show. Hey, Seth, how are you, man? Yeah, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Had a big drive up here this morning from um, Wollongong. It was like uh, three hours in the car. What's your, um, I mean, I find driving travel a, a time to kind of like take content in and like listen to really interesting things. Like what's, what was your, what did you listen to today? Um, I was listening to uh, some stuff on Halloween and astronomy and things that we're going to be chatting about today. And, um, but I drive an old van and it's quite loud. So it's kind of hard to focus because you've got the sound of the van and the highway and then, Yeah podcast rearing the background as well you get some sound cancelling it's not exactly safe when you're driving there <laughs> yeah. <is it? laughs> some big headphones on <laughs> um but yeah no i find it's a really good time to absorb information because i'm not very good at sitting still when i'm at home so like yeah being forced to just drive and then i can let myself think and absorb whatever podcasts i'm listening to which is which is good yeah the right time to learn and kind of um yeah absorb things is yeah, you've got to. Sometimes some people do well in the morning, some people do it at night. Yeah, I'm probably more night time, I think. Yeah. yeah. But whether this is morning or night, today we've got a really interesting topic about the origins of Halloween. And this is one we were talking about a while ago, but there's, and there's been a number of different lines of research and investigation. But I just found this story so interesting as to how the real, true meaning of Halloween. Is something we don't really think about and it's, you know you kind of dress up in a funny way but here in australia we don't really celebrate it very much so i never really understood halloween as a whole but then you really look at p- countries that even do celebrate it you know there there seems to be a lost meaning there and there's just this constant theme of forgetting the origins of traditions were and this one's really interesting yeah and this it gets it's so big like halloween is huge and it's getting when you not really where i grew up but in places like sydney it's halloween is there's kids everywhere running around the streets eating chocolate and candy and like um yeah i i was fascinated by researching this as well because i had no idea that there was anything more to it than that than just like another day uh, just a day for people to dress up and yeah trick or treat and do all that that sort of stuff i mean in the u.s halloween is one of the biggest celebrations of the year it's probably um rivals july 4th i'm not sure yeah i think it's july 4th yeah <laughs> gonna go yeah it's july 4th <laughs> which actually there's, there's an interesting story around that too but the date of october 31st yeah is a huge celebration in the u.s and but it's also across britain as well mm. um, and all over mexico like with the day of the dead celebrations yeah this is the thing is that there's it's not just Halloween. And Halloween celebrated in the US and Britain and stuff it has very, very similar traditions elsewhere, right? Exactly. Mexico, Day of Dead. And it even goes further. It's, it's quite remarkable how global the, um, you know, the, the same themed celebration is. Yeah. And I think looking, when we started looking into this, trying to work out where this all comes from, um, there's a researcher that popped up um, called R.G. Halliburton, who was um, 
a scholar from the 1800s. He was Canadian. I think he was born in 1831. Um, and he was a historian and started documenting evidence for, you know, the, the earliest traditions of Halloween and found that there, there were evidence of people celebrating or commemorating this, this day all over the world, going back hundreds and thousands of years. Um, and that there was no real connection he couldn't find any connection between them, so he was just fascinated by how, again and again, these cultures were commemorating this time of the year. Yeah, and we'll go into that. And some people today suggest that Halloween is the uh, celebration of the uh, a time of harvest and that um, you know period where you know, the northern hemisphere is crossing into winter, and you know the, the death and kind of rebirth this symbolism of harvesting and often there's multi meanings in these ancient cultures and myths but Halliburton found that there was cross similarities from the northern to southern hemisphere too which doesn't make sense in terms of a seasonal um, explanation yeah because in the, in the southern hemisphere you would be going into winter into summer sorry yeah which so doesn't why would up. you have a similar and so what he found is that there was this roughly three-day um, celebration. And so the big one was connection between Peru and the, the Spanish, wasn't there? Yeah, did he... F- was it... When the Spanish arrived, they, they already had this tradition and the, they found the Peruvians already had it too on the, the same day, or the same... I think it was over three days, which was really similar to the early Christians who had um, uh, All Saints Day and All, all Hallows Eve. And it was like... Yeah, it wasn't just there. It was back into ancient... India and Peru, um, Japan, Persia, uh, Egypt as well. All these places, he just kept finding evidence of this like celebration or commemoration and it all had similar themes and it was all kind of relating to a similar kind of collective memory or, um, you know, whatever it was. He was, um, he was finding again and again, it was popping up. Yeah, the Christian tradition, and I didn't really even connect this, that All Saints Day was a three-day um, celebration that links up to Halloween. And then there was even the Druid connection in the UK as well. Um, but then there's also across the Pacific Islands in Tonga and the Pacific Islanders, uh, the same commemoration and uh, um, Indigenous Australians as well. They had um, a Day of the Dead feast type. Um, yeah, to commemorate the ancestors, I mm. think. So it's just the same period and it all occurred roughly late October, early November. Yeah, and all commemorating something to do with death or rebirth or, um, you know, like the way we think about Halloween now with, you know, ghosts and witches and, um, you know, the dead or uh, as it is still in Mexico and places like that. It's all remembering this kind of whatever it was that happened that um, caused all this. Yeah, and it's... You know, people, everyone knows Halloween for this this theme that, it, you know, these strength, you know, skeletons or witches or um, death and fire and all these kind of symbology of death. But we, it, all of a sudden you see the whole world um, celebrating the same theme around the same time, not all exactly on the same day, but it's a, roughly a three day period. And you have to start to wonder well, where the, on earth did it come from? Um, because, you know, yeah. how, so how would two cultures on the other side of the planet, commemorate the same themed holiday and then you know we have to start looking you know for answers for that yeah and that was one thing that Halliburton writes about a lot that he was he couldn't understand what what caused them all to to have this same date with whether I mean it was before the time of um travel I, I mean some cultures were capable of traveling but you know isolated cultures in Polynesia compared to Egypt, you know, with differences of thousands of years between them, all, all remembering the same date. He was kind of, he started postulating that it must have been something something visible in the sky or in the heavens or like some sort of rising of a constellation or whatever it was that everyone was seeing and everyone was recording and that, that was the basis of this date that they were all, um, you know, commemorating. Yeah, he writes in his book that it was really striking and, you know, the apparent coincidences, you know, were just remarkably uh, the same. So that, that's a really interesting story here. 
and you know did it out of the Indo-European tradition that we see today um, being celebrated every year on 31st of October is that harking back to something that was a global tradition before and that's pretty remarkable really and you know even we'll look into this but a lot of our holidays do seem to have these very ancient uh, meanings and we do forget and um, you know forgetting about what something was really about kind of defeats the purpose of you putting on a witch costume right you, you should at least <laughs> yeah. know what you what you're celebrating yeah so but the words and the the uh, different uh, mythology sets that across the different cultures seemed to have you know a certain theme to they seem to um, all link to symbology of Taurus or the bull um, and there are different words in described by for instance the Egyptians with they do they use the um, it was Hathor wasn't it yeah they're um the the month of November where I mean when 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 November starts um, they're the month the Egyptians called November Athol um, which is also the name um, of that part of the sky of the bull um, so it was really it was it wasn't just the Egyptians though there were I think the the Persians and the Chaldeans and the Hebrews as well all had this same word that both signified the month of November, but also this region of the sky where the bull, where Taurus sits. And um, yeah, I think it, even the Arab name for that region is called Artoria, which is very similar to what we used to say of Taurus. Yeah. And so now we're starting to get to when you start to look at this, because um, we'll look at this in terms of how it links to the calendar a bit, but you're starting to get a theme that looks to the sky. And then now we're starting to see the world was the Halloween tradition commemorating an astronomical phenomena. And that seems, you know, like a reasonable explanation when you see a global tradition arising with the same rough date. And so what could possibly cause this, this you know, what astronomical uh, phenomena could possibly cause this? And in the mines, there was actually an astronomer uh, called Hagar Stansbury who wrote in in a book in 1931, how Tonta Mocha, I think if that's pronounced correctly, the, the Mayan tradition of uh, a lord of death falling from heaven to earth at this time. And so this is this same theme and there's astronomical links to the Torah, um, the, the Torah's bull, and it, it links very similarly across to, um, you know, the other themes of what people seem to be um, commemorating this time. It's written in the Dresden Codex. There are many different ways that they uh, represent it, but so there's a lot of symbology associated with the bull and this fire coming down. Yeah, and like a fight, fighting the bull, because it, it was like whatever was happening in that part of the sky at that time of year was, yeah, it was the, the imagery of the bull that was kind of recording that um, that story. Like the uh, one of the old, I think, yeah, I think it's the oldest um, story in the world the the epic of gilgamesh he in that he's fighting a bull or he stabs a bull i mean the the, the imagery and symbolism of the bull has been there since the start and it's all kind of it all points every every culture that that had it had this idea of the bull it's all pointing to the same time of year um yeah it's crazy i, I can't imagine what um when halliburton was uncovering all this back back then he would have just been surrounded by you know, all these books and different obscure references and just like piecing it all together. Yeah, it's a big been. job, isn't it? And you can see how it gets lost. But, you know, when we started first talking about this and, um, you know, there's, it's very difficult to find any discussion on the true meaning of Halloween, so, you know, besides that idea of the harvest and just the purely seasonal idea. But that doesn't make sense when you've got a global tradition. And so when you start to think of this astronomically you're like okay so what could that possibly be representing and then atoria which is the arab word um that represents this um well that is associated with this ph phenomena uh represents the um constellation taurus and so there is a torrid meteor stream too isn't it that that passes the earth passes through twice a year and so what 
this, what we believe this was, was a huge media that actually broke up into many pieces. And we, if you think of the our solar system on a flat plane, uh, which is the traditional way you see it, but it's not, but we'll talk about this later. But if you think of the sun and the planets revolving around, the Torrid media stream takes an ellipse course through the path of the planets around the sun and back out again. So it's, and we pass it twice. So if you think about that ellipse, if you draw this, and we'll put an image onto the show notes for this, um, you'll see that the Earth passes the Torrid media stream twice. And we have dates for this, which is late June and late October, early November. And then, so now we're starting to see, it was like, wow, there could be an astronomical marking of the Torrid media stream associated with potentially maybe Halloween. Yeah, and they, they name, the Torrid media stream is named after the constellation of Taurus because it kind of, as we pass through it, it doesn't actually originate from this, um, from the, that constellation, but that it, it appears that way from our perspective. I mean, that there's lots of different um, media streams. There's the Torrids, there's the Geminids, which look like they're coming from Gemini. There's the Leonids, you know, they, they name them because it, it looks as if they're coming. Yeah, so if you look at the constellation of Leo at November 17, you see the Leonid media stream. So that's how they kind of... The, and we'll cover this in more detail later, but just for the purpose of this podcast. Yeah, yeah, just to get your head around. Yeah, because yeah. it's... it's um, Yeah, it's really... Because I had no idea that that happened until I started. And then you can go out at night and if, it's, if there's enough stars in the sky and it's a clear night and you go out, you can actually see huge... Um, activity, you know, at certain times of the year when we pass through this. Yeah, these this is an streams. astronomical phenomena. Like, we, we know. Yeah. You know, you know, since then we've we've been able to record and, and understand. And so on, in late October, early November, if you go out in the middle of the night, you'll see the passing of the Torrid media stream. It's like a flash of light through the sky. And what's interesting is that the Halloween tradition says that if you put your clothes inside out and walk backwards, which sounds pretty strange, but outside on Halloween night, you will see a witch flying in the sky at midnight. And people used to believe witches were the devil. And so then there's this death and dread thing coming up. But were, was it just a way to describe a media stream? You know, a witch kind of looks like, you know, with the broom at the back, that stream of... Yeah, and they, they say it's like, uh, yeah, it kind of looks like when you sweep a broom, that flash and kind of that... Um yeah, the look of the meteor when it enters the atmosphere, it's kind of like you can imagine it's just being swept across the sky. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. Different cultures had different symbolism. So like there's, the, you know, the skulls and death um, in Mexico and then the, there's the witch and th- that sort of imagery. But it's all like, it's all very linked to the same sort of central theme. Um, Completely. And yeah and we know also too you see this similar symbology and description of meteors across cultures too um and it does seem to follow that theme because what are they in is it in peru or the the mayans used to call them hairs or hairs falling from the sky or something like that yeah and that's how they and the amazing thing about the mayans is that there was such fantastic mathematicians that is that in the glyphs they describe they describe the you know the the time of year the um, the astronomical features of which they come out of um, and but it all seems to follow this same idea doesn't it yeah so I think the in late in the northern hemisphere at least in late um, October early November when we pass through the torrid meter stream it happens at, at night um, at mid so like if you look at the night sky late at night or at midnight or whenever it may be it looks like there's you can see you can see them all coming because it's it's obviously night time there's no sun in the sky to, to hide it all but this the when we we pass when earth passes through in late june um in the northern hemisphere if you look it, it happens during the day so you can't see um you can't see it because the sun is in the way so the the there's a really famous example of this in um, 1908, I think, um, the Tang- Tangus- Tunguska meteor impact, which, um, you know, the, the, it, it, was a de- it happened in the daytime and people who observed it, there was all these accounts of people saying it looked like it was, it was coming straight from the sun or it was, it was born from the sun or it was shot from the sun, which it wasn't, but it just from our perspective, um, if the sun wasn't there, it would have looked like it was coming from the bull, not the sun. 
Um, yeah, and the Tunguska impact wasn't even an impact. And we've talked about briefly, I think it was the Megaphone episode, wasn't it? Um, on If you see, if you look up the, um, the article on this on the website, the impact uh, radius on the ground is actually from, it's a tiny, tiny little debris of a comet of the, the torrid meteor stream. This is how big this thing is. And <laughs> yeah. it, it hit the atmosphere and broke up and sent like a shock wave down and just flattened the like trees for i can't remember the radius but it's, it's yeah it's, you, you, so you can see images online of you know whole forest being flattened i think it was 80 million trees got wiped out and that wasn't even hitting the earth that was ex- that was just an airburst exactly, when, once it yeah. entered the atmosphere wow like I, I remember seeing that god it was probably the late 90s just seeing the picture of this tunguski and i was just like whoa what is this and you know i'd never heard of it and yeah because you never think that there's things going on outside the earth that's why I've been so fascinated about this. It's like, not only is this is this um, astronomical memory still alive through Halloween, but it was so important to the um, ancient, like the ancient cultures who remembered it, that they had a, they, yeah, it was part of their culture to commemorate and understand that this, this happens every year and it could potentially cause a lot of harm or, or you know, just destroy. If, if like, if Tungus, if that, um, Tunguska event happened over a city, like over New York or anywhere in the world, it would just completely flatten and completely just change that enti- an entire city. That's right. And yeah, like if you think about, so it hits Siberia, one of the most isolated areas on the planet. It's probably the luckiest place that it could have <laughs> yeah. hit in the, beside you know, the ocean. And th- but we do have uh, crossings with these things. And this is twice a year we're crossing this stream. And it's, it's, there's obviously big things because this is a little one. But what's interesting is that it happened in late June, so it was associated with when we're, as you said, passing. So people described it as this second sun coming. And when you look at the ellipse that the Tunguska, sorry, the Torrid Meteor Stream takes and the way the Earth has it, one time we, we cross it in the morning, so you won't really see it. But if there's a big one we actually come into contact with, then it comes into our realm that's what they saw that's what they just desc- the locals described the second sun shooting and then hitting and then this destructions it didn't kill many people but there were people in the radius that kind of experienced it um and then the one in november is when i think we're passing out of the stream um or it's the motions are a bit different and so that's why we just see the shooting uh in the night time rather than in the morning so there's two different relations to the sun because the torrid media stream goes around the sun and the second one is potentially leaving um, instead of going toward the sun might be the other way around but we'll have to check we're gonna we're gonna come yeah it's, it's hard describing this without images it to is. show as well yeah. yeah but um yeah it's it's you yeah you forget how, how much is going on outside and it's, it's crazy how periodic um it's just like clockwork like it's the same time it, it doesn't it doesn't really change at all and it's obviously been the same for Whatever, however many thousand. I mean, the Egyptians had the same, um, had had, a, had the same um, celebration or re- recollection. That was that they'd been re- the yeah the dynasty started three thousand ish BC. So that's five potentially five thousand years or more of remembrance. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a deep history, isn't it? And then yeah, so. But now you kind of, when you put it into modern astronomical terms and monitoring these asteroid belts, you you see and you sit look at history, like in what was it nineteen twenties Tunguska or thirties happened. Um, uh, 1908, I think. Nineteen oh eight. Yeah. Um, so not, not that long ago. No, no. Yeah. And yeah, and that's just like kind of a little sneak peek of what could happen. And then you've got this death and uh, kind of dread and you know evil spirit um commemoration happening all around the earth at that period like this is really it starts to build this interesting um yeah did something happen to kind of make everyone be warned that it could happen again or just to commemorate the fact that there were people who were potentially impacted by an event that happened around that time of year yeah and what's really interesting is when you follow because the this is why ancient you know, cultures are so interesting and so important because they seem to write levels of information into their stuff. So, like, for instance, that epic of Gil- Gilgamesh, you know, the slaying of the bull shot, which is 
could be seen as an astronomical um, uh, reference to the the, the Taurus, um, and but then so it starts to go a bit deeper, doesn't it? And so we start to see, for instance, the times that the time of year in the calendar systems, there is a connection there between the in the epic of Gilgamesh, it's the shoulder of the bull that is slain at this time, and that relates to the sh what's seen as the shoulder of the um, the the Taurid constellation, Taurus constellation, as being the Pleiades. And then so this Pleiades um, reference pops up more and more all throughout this Halloween tradition. So the rattlesnake, which is uh, the mine on the glyphs, they had that symbology around it. Um, so the, the rattlesnake symbolised the Pleiades for the, for the mines. So in that, exactly. Yeah, and that, the, is it one of the codices of the um, depicting this kind of Taurid um, impact or like a astronomical meteor um, event it's it's always drawn with this rattlesnake that the, the two are the two are really linked and connected together yeah um yeah even like the because we, we've been talking about calendar systems and ancient calendars the ancient hindu calendar marked the start of the year by um the rising of the pleiades which was which happens at the the same time as halloween which is like another pleiades link it's when it's it's hard to describe without images but it's when if you if you look at midnight on at the uh, late um, late October, look at the sky at midnight in the northern hemisphere. You see the Pleiades right in the middle of the sky. If you look directly south, and that that was kind of like imagine the for the for the um, the ancient Indians they'd see that as a um, kind of like a clock striking twelve and the year begins there. Um, and I think the Egyptians as well and other ancient cultures, the name for the Pleiades was the, na the name they had for November. So they had, it was all kind of linked together and they were remembering. It's Athor in Egyptian, which is Egyptian November, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And the, the interesting thing about Athor is um, and the Egyptian god Athor is seen with a bull head. So there's, there's this symbolism that goes through lots of layers, but it's always kind of, um, circling around the Pleiades and circling around the bull and this, you know, event that potentially potentially happened. Yeah, and we touched on this a little bit in the Gregorian calendar episode, didn't we? How ancient cultures used to start the year by looking at the reference to Sirius. Um, and so there were lots of different ways, and we're going to cover this a lot more because every calendar system is remarkable how unique it is, but there was a common theme of starting the year not on a step day like we do in the Gregorian system but on astronomical alignments and the Pleiades was the Hindu but also the mine as well there was you know there's a link up to you know Chichen Itza and the 2012 as to how the Pleiades lined up and there's many many ways you can measure that as it lines up in the meridian of the sky yeah that's the that's the fascinating thing about these old um calendar systems and astronomical systems they're all so that they had so many different ways of, of measuring time it wasn't just yeah the solar year or the, the lunar year it was yeah there was i mean some some cultures had five or ten different calendars all marking you know huge variations of astronomical events and different motions of bodies and it was all but it was all connected in a way that was important enough to remember and to keep track of yeah and the the really interesting way that this all wraps up is that the pleiades uh discussions in um in the mythology associates with uh, the talk of Halloween. And so they talk about the Pleiades and the bull and the shoulder of the bull. And when you can see how this then relates to the Torrid media stream, how, uh, because at this time in early November, late October, when the Pleiades is crossing the meridian, the Taurus, uh, Torrid media stream seems to come out of that area of the sky. Yeah, so you can imagine why in, in myth mythology that story would be remembered as, you know, the bull's attacking Earth or attacking you, and if you can defeat the bull, then you can get past that moment and, and move on and, yeah, literally pass through the, the stream, which is, yeah, it's, it's crazy wrapping your head around that. I mean, that's a, that's a really great way of remembering something, but the fact that cultures all around the world have the same sim symbolism, the same memory, and it's still... I've, 
a life it's a lot i mean the the meaning of it isn't as alive today as before but the celebration of it is everyone knows halloween it's such a great way of yeah recording information i guess if you tell tell it in story form completely and yeah the symbology of death might be commemorating people that were maybe um killed during a previous impact you know like you said this goes back at least five thousand years so you know it could be a, a time before that um you know we've talked about how there is good evidence now of a cataclysm level event around the young dries periods we'll look into that more and potentially how this connects um but what's interesting is that the when you look at media streams too when you look at the sky they they seem to stream out of one point which is called the radiant point and you can imagine one spot in the sky that doesn't move and then everything else is streaming towards you which is what the torrid media stream does and the same thing happens with the lenience and so forth but the Pleiades is, is that radiant point on the torrid media stream which is just it's it, you know it goes beyond coincidence that cultures all around the world would be referring to the Pleiades and the Taurus and this date you know I it, there, there has to be in my mind some kind of connection or reference to, um, you know, maybe it's even just observing the media stream or, or you know, we know that it broke up. So in August 2000, uh, Comet Linear, we observed a break, a huge comet break up into a media stream, which is what likely happened with the Torrid, uh, the Torrid media stream, that it was a big media that broke up. So maybe they're, maybe they're commemorating the time it broke up where they observed it in the sky, but. Mm, yeah, there's, it's, yeah, it's a completely astronomical phenomenon. Like there's a, it's a lot weak. It's a lot less. Like the the objects in the torrid media stream are a lot smaller than they were once, because it's you know it's just been breaking up, disintegrating, as it as it gets sucked into different orbits and that sort of thing. But back, you, I don't know how far in history it would have been a lot more active with a lot more larger objects and a lot more potential for things like Tunguska to happen again and cause destruction and cause you know things that would impact the people living on the earth or the animals or anything yeah the evidence is quite compelling when you put it together isn't it when you put the tradition that comes with global um you know uh, a global similar theme on the same date you've got the astronomical um uh, knowledge of the torrid media stream and that those dates then you've got the tunguska event that happened you know not too long ago you know just a century ago and then all of these references to um, you know the the astronomy of it all, but then you know for instance, like these these impacts happen a lot, and even the close encounters you know we don't really talk about it. But in '96 we watched Shoemaker Levy Nine hit Jupiter, and it was a huge impact, and we knew this was going to happen. Yeah, the, wasn't the, the meteor bigger than Earth? Or it was huge. Like if it, if Jupiter hadn't have sucked it into its orbit, and it it would have been the end of Earth if it hit Earth. Like, yeah, and like that was just kind of something we were like, oh, that's good. But like, <laughs> yeah. clearly, this is like impacting Earth, and we do. We we pass this thing twice, so you know, maybe it's kind of like a warning thing. Um, you know, that ancient cultures has that you, you need to watch out for this thing. Yeah, right? we're not as advanced as we thought we were. If one of these things comes, it's game over pretty much. Yeah, and, and the I- interesting thing is, we we are starting to form the technology, like to mine. Um, meteors and uh, and so forth so there is potential technology to be able to maybe protect and we can you know you can um calculate the path of meteors and the path of earth and what the probability of impact and uh, so you know maybe we're at a time now where we should be thinking about this yeah i I love looking into all this stuff and and seeing you know the the crossover from myth into there's, there's these folk this folklore and mythology that exists but then we're now at the stage where we have enough resources and, and technology to to look in, into the geological record and look at all the work that's been done that sort of validates a lot of these ancient traditions, which is so fascinating. And it's nice to be like, like I remember um, when we were talking about um, yeah, like the the origins of geology and and how when when it first began, um, there was a they were trying to separate. Um, you know, religious ideologies from science. And it was, there was a lot of talk. There's a lot of, you know, all over religions, in all religions all, all over the world, there's talk of this huge deluge and the destruction of the world by water. And, and that was kind of not taken seriously by the sci- emerging scientific community because it was seen as just a pr- religious fantasy and not really, didn't really have any grounding in um, scientific, it didn't really have a scientific 
foundation. Um, but now it's interesting seeing that a lot of these ancient stories talking about astronomical events or, um, you know, Earth impacting events, there is ground for, you know, having these conversations that maybe there is more to these stories than just, um, just mythology. And I think, yeah, reading Hamlet's Mill was definitely really eye-opening for that, just how these stories do, if you trace them back far enough, they do have an astronomical sort of basis. It's really, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, and there's no question that these ancient cultures, ancient sites had you know, deep astronomical understanding and meaning. You know, we, we've, that's been well established now across the world. And so, yeah, there's a lot of information here that um, you know, we're going to cover the Mayan calendar in quite a lot, well, all the calendar systems, but the, the there's no doubt that there was this high, high, you know, universal appreciation um, and, you know, how we fit it. Like the, the reality is that, you know, humans fit into this whole picture. This We are, you know, children of the universe and, you know, our future, the, our future generations depend on this planet being stable. And so, you know, maybe the idea that we do cross the Torrid Media Stream twice a year is something we need to think about. And maybe that this Halloween tradition was there to remind us of this. So, I don't know, I think these kind of stories are important. This is why I've found it so fascinating to jump into ancient cultures and because then you find this amazing interface between what we know now and what they were, they were alluding to then and then it's like, whoa, hang on, it's time to think about this stuff. Yeah, and it's, you don't really think about Earth as... You know, having being in any danger because you think you know, 65 million years ago, the Earth was hit by a meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs. But that sort of thing only happens. You know, it doesn't happen. It just you know, it's something we talk about. But yeah, the, the more I mean, for me, learning about Halloween and, and understanding the torrid media stream and media streams in general, there's a lot going on, and it's like, yeah, you could you could take it very literally and be terrified and never leave your house. But it's just, I think it's good to be aware of it and to understand that it's not only a risk for us but it's it's been a risk for everyone that's walked on the earth yeah and you know what we're learning about mars now potentially is you know showing that it was very much a planet like earth that um you know that had a thriving life on it and so you know it's a lot its life cycle is a lot later than ours and so maybe that's a a sign of what can happen we know that can happen you know that we are um you know, we're intrinsically connected to or extrinsically connected to the um, what's happening in our souls and wider systems as well. Yeah, and if you if you stripped away the earth of all the water and all the trees and and it, it was just laid bare, um, it would look just like the moon. Like there there it has been peppered by meteors since its creation. And you I mean you can't see it now because there's so much life. But yeah, as you said, if it was if it were to be stripped like that, it would just look like a big rock. Like and what's interesting about Tunguska is that you're looking at it now, you see how the tree, you can still see the impact now that the trees have been flattened, but you can see how in 60, 70, maybe 100 years, it'd be gone. And so if no one recorded that and you didn't have any, you, it's forgotten. Yet it was potentially a civilization changing event from a tiny part of this tour of Yeah, stream. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's crazy thinking about the scale of that. If you put that, even if it was yeah, twice as big, it could potentially wipe out an entire... Um, you know, most of the country or yeah, it's 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 crazy. Yeah, let's not get too cataclysmic, <laughs> but look, but that, it's, it's, it's interesting though because like the Halloween thing kind of sends you down that line. It's like, wow, did all is all this death and dread theme talking about an impact or potential impact? Yeah, I, yeah, and it's really it, it just it changes your perspective on things. I mean, for me anyway, you, you kind of things that are not you can kind of realize things that aren't so important um, in your life. When there are things that could potentially end it, but yeah, it's not. It's not doom and gloom. It's just it's nice to um, if anyone has the chance to see the stars that time of year. Um, yeah, you can see you can watch the so uh, in Halloween this year you can watch the um, the Torrid Media Stream passing. If you go out, you know between twelve and two a.m. that kind of time frame, you'll see it streaming through the sky. All right, I think we covered it all, man. That's a, it's such an interesting topic. We're going to do more on these media streams they're really interesting um and what for instance um uh, ancient cultures knew about them the referral to them and also the geological aspect to the history and prehistory but so next week we're going to talk about uh let's talk about the pineal gland yeah well that's a that's a big topic (laughs) yeah (laughs) i'm excited for that one okay all right 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, Thanks for listening, guys. It's, um, yeah, it's been really exciting learning about this and sharing it. Thank you for listening to today's show. For more information, you can read the full transcript, articles, and discussion on our website, humanoriginproject.com. You can visit us on social media at Human Origin Project on Facebook and The Human Origin Project on Instagram. Follow us on Twitter or join the forum boards and email list to keep up to date with all the new information. And if you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe on iTunes and leave a review because it helps others to find this information and helps us to bring you the topics you want to discuss and hear about. Until next week, I hope your life is filled with happiness, healthiness, and harmony.